Okay, okay so uh, full smiles. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Um, as Duncan said, uh, my name is Paul Smart. I'm from uh, the University of Southampton, and in fact, I'm, I'm not a philosopher, I'm a computer scientist. Um, I uh, originate from the, the School of Electronics and Computer Science at Southampton. And the way in which um, I've approached um, uh, uh, topics that have been under consideration here at Edinburgh is very much from my home discipline, which is web science. But I'm very much interested in topics that lie at the heart of a number of disciplines and, and topics within philosophy. So um, from a kind of empirical perspective, I'm very much working in disciplines such as web science, network science, um, and, and looking at issues of collective intelligence. And then in terms of kind of philosophical interests, um, my primary interest is extended cognition, um, but thanks to the Extended Knowledge Project, I've also developed um, at least an interest in, if not necessarily an expertise in, uh, virtue epistemology. So um, what I'm planning to do uh, in, in this presentation is provide a summary of some of the issues that, that I've been preoccupied with over the last <clears throat> year or so. So in the context of this presentation, I'm going to look at the, the nature of extended knowledge, what we mean by that, and I'm going to look at that primarily from a virtue theoretic epistemological perspective. Um, I'm also going to look at issues of um, web technologies and the extent to which they might support the emergence of web extended cognitive systems or what we might, might call web extended minds. And then I'm also going to, to briefly uh, provide an overview of how I think these issues play out um, at the social level, in a social context. So first of all, um, it's important to note that uh, in, in epistemology, in virtue epistemology, there are a number of different strands um, of virtue epistemological theorizing, um, and you can see three of them here. These are all subtypes of virtue epistemology. Um, the one that I'm going to be concerned with here is what's a position that goes under the heading of virtue reliabilism. So just be aware of that. I'm going to talk about virtue epistemology, but um, there are, uh, in addition to virtue reliabilistic ideas, there are also other forms of virtue epistemology. And in terms of what virtue reliabilism is, we can characterize that as, um, with, uh, in terms of the following definition. So from a virtue reliabilistic perspective, uh, we might say that knowledge can be characterized as uh, S knows that uh, a proposition P, if and only if, S believes the truth with respect to P because S's belief is produced by cognitive ability. So issues of cognitive ability lie at the heart of um, uh, uh, our notions of knowledge from a virtue reliabilistic perspective. And a, another way of saying this uh, that is sometimes encountered in the literature um, is, is what's known or referred to as the, the kind of credit view of knowledge. So if knowledge is the product of one's cognitive abilities, then you can say that to some extent an individual deserves credit for believing the truth in something. So another way of kind of presenting these ideas is to resort to formal modeling. And because I'm a computer scientist, this is my my natural way of working. So what I've tried to do here as I've become more familiar with epistemological concepts is build formal machine-readable models of the epistemological domain so that they can be used as a kind of sanity check regarding my own understanding. So don't be kind of intimidated by all the UML no notations. These are kind of notations that are used in requirements engineering and computer science. But essentially what this is saying is that we have this notion of an epistemic agent an epistemic agent has a belief, and then um, we, the, the, the epistemic agent can be said to be a knower when the truth status of the agent's belief um, is produced by a cognitive ability that's classified as an intellectual virtue, and the notion of intellectual virtue here is cashed out in terms of the, the truth conduciveness of a cognitive ability, so the extent to which a cognitive ability produces true beliefs, 
And those intellectual virtues, of which there are more than one, all form part of the cognitive character of an epistemic agent. Now, the nice thing about this kind of representation is that it, it shows how easily it is to take that core definition of virtue reliabilism and then build around that our notions of um, uh, uh, collective knowledge and extended knowledge. So here, for purposes of illustration, um, I've expanded on some of the, the concepts that lie at the heart of virtue reliabilism and just kind of fleshed those out to show how one might begin to uh, uh, think about um, uh, uh, collective knowledge, knowledge in a kind of social context from a virtue reliabilistic perspective. And all we've done here really is to specialize the notions of epistemic agent, um, cognitive ability, and cognitive process. And we can do pretty much the same when it comes to extended knowledge. So one way of extended, uh, one way of understanding extended knowledge is to take our core notions of virtue reliabilism and then expand on our concepts of epistemic agents, cognitive abilities, and extended cognitive processes. And so what we end up with is this notion of extended knowledge as um, true beliefs that result from, um, uh, that are the product of cognitive processes uh, that um, re reflect the exercise of cognitive abilities that are classified as intellectual virtues integrated into an, a, an agent's cognitive character. So Andy has already talked about um, notions of cognitive extension and, and the web extended mind. So when we think about kind of um, uh, web technologies, um, we need to kind of think about the extent to which web technologies uh, provide opportunities for uh, cognitive extension and the potential impact that that might have on our status as knowers, as web extended knowers. So the, the, kind of, the application of extended mind theorizing to, um, to the web is sometimes glossed as this notion of web extended minds. So all of that, all that means is that in the case of a web extended mind, the technological and informational elements of the web can form part of the physical machinery that realizes a human agent's mental states and processes. And we can build on that to, um, uh, to provide a, an account of what a web extended knower is. So a web extended knower is essentially the same sort of thing, right? It's, um, it's still a cognitive system that is made up of biological and non-biological elements, the non-biological elements being part of the web. But in this case, what we're looking for is um, a particular link between the cognitive processes that comprise that agent and the truth status of beliefs that the agent goes on to form. So all of this is fine in principle, but the question is to what extent do web technologies actually uh, provide opportunities to, uh, to support the emergence of web extended uh, cognitive systems. And I'm not going to, to go into too much detail here, but what I wanted to do is just provide a kind of a general flavor of some of the ways in which emerging technologies uh, in, in web science provide properties that I think support um, the possibility of, of extended cognitive systems. So the first um, technology to think about is, is what's known as the data-centric web or the web of data. And this is the idea that um, in place of the, the contemporary web that, that we know and love in the present day, which is sometimes referred to as the web of documents, it's a, a web that consists of document-based resources or web pages, we can move from that towards a more data-centric representation where the resources that are accessible on the web um, resemble something more akin to a, a globally distributed database. So what we have instead of interlinked uh, documents is a set of kind of interlinked data assets or data items. And in the, in the paper that's available on the Google Drive, I talk about this in a lot of detail about the way in which I think this move to an, a different mode of information representation on the web provides opportunities for 
for us to engage with online information in a new way, in a way that's much more um, supportive of uh, the possibility of extended cognition. So the data-centric web, I suggest, provides us with new opportunities to combine, integrate, merge, juxtapose data in ways that support our ongoing thoughts and actions in productive ways. It also enables us, of course, to engineer um, new types of applications that focus on specific capabilities. So we're already moving into this era where the web browser is being supplemented, if not entirely supplanted, by uh, data-driven apps that provide capabilities in specific areas. And that, all of that is kind of driven by um, the availability to, of uh, large-scale data repositories on the web. Treating the web as a kind of global distributed uh, database provides opportunities for us to query information in different ways. So rather than just providing keyword searches, we can also think about semantic queries, queries that get at just the information that we want to, uh, to have access to in particular uh, contexts and situations. And those aren't necessarily queries that we ourselves are executing. They could be queries that technological accoutrements are executing on our behalf. And then another issue for consideration here, one that speaks to issues of the availability of, 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 of information, is the, the way in which uh, data, uh, uh, the data-centric web is largely agnostic with respect to applications and devices. So once the information is out there, it can be tailored to be presented on different kinds of devices. And that means that you're not tied to one particular kind of device. Uh, you, can, you can access the same body of information across multiple devices and platforms. Now, you might say, well, you know, you're making a real song and dance about all of that. But don't underestimate the importance and the transformative impact of a ubiquitous data environment. Um, to give you kind of some sense of, of how I think um, this kind of move to the era of a data-centric web, the kinds of opportunities that that might give us, think about the, the constant stream of data that's around us all the time that's provided by GPS satellites circling overhead. The availability of that continuous ubiquitous data has transformed the way in which we solve navigational problems. And in fact, some people might say it's changing the, the, new, the kind of neurological structure of our brains involved in, in, in those kinds of tasks. But I think more importantly than that, it's also kind of provided the niche in which we can think about the development of new kinds of human machine hybrid technologies, but also new kinds of autonomous systems. So drones and driverless cars are all technologies that rely on the existence of this kind of um, ubiquitous, continuous stream of, uh, of data. So another feature of um, technologies that I think is important um, are technologies that go under the heading of, of, of wearable devices, wearable technologies. So these are becoming increasingly popular. I think one thing that's very interesting here, and it was actually referred to by um, by Frank Bjorka in the late 1990s, is this notion of progressive embodiment. So the idea is um, that as technologies advance, so they become more kind of intimate, they become forms of intimate machinery. And so when we look at the way in which web technologies or web-enabled devices at least are evolving, they seem to be, it's not so much that our kind of minds, or not just that our minds may be extending outwards, it's also the case that our technologies are starting to encroach on the, the body. And that's important because it means that the information that those devices are providing is becoming just as available as information that might be retrieved from our biological uh, brains. And then um, a, a final kind of strand of technology development one that's likely to be uh, very significant um, this year with the potential release of Google Glass 2 and Microsoft HoloLens and various other kind of uh, virtual reality or augmented reality devices. Um, it's this kind of idea that the web to date has been something that exists 
beyond the kind of web browser interface. But with the development of these new kinds of technologies, we're situating the web at the heart of our very embodied interactions with the world. And in addition to, to making um, uh, the web potentially more accessible via the use of these augmented reality devices, we're also providing opportunities for the next generation to configure their environments in ways that we were never able to do. So we're no longer, no longer limited by the constraints of physical reality when it comes to the design and configuration of the environments that then scaffold our intellectual and cognitive capabilities. So, so that all seems very good. And so from an epistemological perspective, you might think that we're poised on um, the cusp of this new era of, 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 of seeing a, an expansion or an explosion in our epistemic capabilities and our knowledge. And indeed, some epistemologists have indeed gone down that route. So Ludwig last year wrote a paper in which he talked about the way in which this new era of web extended minds would lead to an explosion of knowledge. And we have similar sentiments expressed by Jering and Pedersen. The basic idea here is that if we could engineer the right kind of technology, if we could support the right kind of access to the web, then with respect to the, the notion of, of web extended minds and um, web-based forms of cognitive extension, it becomes possible to think about ourselves as knowing everything that the web makes available. The idea would be that my personal body of knowledge and beliefs would only be limited by the kind of contact that I had with the World Wide Web. And there's some very interesting recent studies coming out of the cognitive psychology community. So Fisher et al are one example, but not by any means the only one. Um, uh, the, this group have essentially tried to look at what the, the subjective effects of internet access, web access are in terms of our feelings of what we know. And what they report is that individuals who spend a lot of time using the web, searching for information, they tend to get confused between what things they know, uh, what knowledge is contained in their head and what knowledge is contained outside in the world. And they kind of, they kind of cast this in a negative light. Um, but the, the kind of core idea is that um, the more that we use the internet, the more we rely on the internet, um, the more uh, we may feel that what information that exists out there on the web um, is just part of our own personal body of knowledge. So we have this kind of alteration in our epistemic esteem or epistemic uh, uh, credentials. So I think the issue of web extended knowers is a very important one to consider, and, and that's backed up by, by recent findings uh, as I said, coming out of the cognitive psychology community. But there is a problem, I think, and uh, Andy has already um, touched on this, albeit in a slightly different form. Um, and that is that I think when we think about the properties of technology, um, we encounter a potential tension between our notions of what it takes to yield an extended cognitive agent and what it might take to yield an extended knower. <coughs> So one thing that, that we observe is that when we engineer technologies to support fluency, so when we provide fluent access to information, we sometimes fall foul of what's called a truth bias. So the more fluently we're able to access information via a technology, the more likely we are to believe that that information is true. And of course, that's not always the case. Similarly, when we try to kind of engineer data in a way that supports uh, fluent, rapid, and easy access, we sometimes kind of inadvertently change the epistemic uh, context in which that information exists in a, what you might regard as a somewhat pernicious way. So when I was talking about the move to the data-centric web and how wonderful that was, the problem is that when you take, when you take data from its conventional location in a web page and you put it into some sort of database, you're losing a lot of the context that might be used by a human agent to make epistemically relevant judgments about the credibility of that information. 
So is there any, what's the kind of answer there? Well, I think one kind of response may be um, to, to think about the way in which the web exists um, increasingly as a form of critical infrastructure for society. Um, so I want to suggest that one of the, um, one of the ways in which um, the, we may be able to rely on the web is the fact that the web is becoming increasingly involved in any number of social processes. So there is this degree of kind of social dependence on the web. Um, and that means, well, three things, two of them good, one of them not so good. So one of the good things is if everyone is relying on a common body of information, if that body of information is important for the proper functioning of society, for a proper functioning of a social process, then if something goes wrong, if that information is subverted in some way, then you soon get to know about it because the process doesn't work anymore and chaos ensues. The other good thing is things that are that important, a body of information that is so important to the proper functioning of society is rapidly fixed if something does go wrong. So if you think about perhaps the role that road signs play in terms of the orchestration of traffic, we're very reliant on those traffic signs and symbols in order to support collective navigation. If, some, if somebody subverts those signs, we all know about it because nobody goes anywhere and, and traffic chaos ensues. But um, if something does go wrong, then there's a, 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 a high motivation to put that problem right. So those are the two good things. The bad thing is that uh, resources that are essential to the proper functioning of society become uh, high value targets for the bad guys. So they become targets uh, that, for example, terrorist organizations might want to attack in order to bring society to its knees. So I'm not going to talk about that. Um, another <clears throat> issue that I, I wanted to uh, discuss, and this is kind of more moving away from the focus on individual uh, uh, agents as individual knowers and thinking more about the social domain, is this notion of Mandevillian intelligence. So this is something that uh, was developed in the context of the Extended Knowledge Project, partly as a result of my collaboration with uh, Andy Duncan, Arrestis, and, and Andy. And what this is, is essentially is um, an hypothesis about a particular form of collective intelligence where the idea is that individual uh, cognitive limitations, shortcomings, cognitive vices might play a positive functional role in the realization of more virtuous properties at a collective level. So the idea is grounded in research in cognitive science um, that focuses on the way in which, at least on occasion, a cognitive shortcoming like working memory constraints, um, our tendency to forget, or even when we're young, immature perceptual and cognitive capabilities, the way in which they can sometimes, although they seem like vices, they're actually important for the development or the realization of more virtuous properties. What we've done is kind of take that idea, but then kind of um, apply it to the social domain. So the idea behind Mandevillian intelligence is essentially that you could have a group of individuals that all have some sort of vice-like properties. They might have um, particular cognitive biases, they might have personality traits that seem inimical to, to the acquisition of true beliefs, possession of knowledge. But, given, but if you can kind of orchestrate their interactions in the right sort of way, then you can nevertheless reap uh, collective epistemic benefits or collective epistemic rewards. And all of that's going to sound, of course, very, um, uh, very wishy-washy. But there are a couple of kind of key examples. So um, one, uh, uh, there is a paper in the literature uh, that was published a few years ago that ran computer simulations looking at agents that uh, 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 were very dogmatic in nature. So they're very resistant to social influence, uh, very resistant to social influence. 
Uh, and uh, some of those agents, of course, had true beliefs, some had false beliefs. What the results of that simulation show, the community of dogmatic agents um, actually outperforms agents that are much more susceptible to social influence, um, simply because by being dogmatic, you avoid premature convergence on a suboptimal solution. So what one tends to find in, in, in this kind of literature is that agent diversity or cognitive diversity tends to be something of a virtue. And the more a technology can support the diversity of agent beliefs in a community, the better the ultimate kind of outcome in terms of uh, collective performance. So what all this tends to suggest is a notion of virtue relativism. So the issue here is that when we think about epistemic vices and virtues and the way in which they might contribute to, to knowledge, we need to think about whether we are looking um, at an agent or a technology from a, an individual or a collective perspective because the virtuous character of that agent or that technology may not be the same if our focus is on the individual as opposed to uh, the collective level. And one example, I think, where this becomes relevant is when we think about the epistemic impact of certain kinds of web technologies. So a lot of attention in the epistemological literature has been devoted to the epistemic impact of personalized search. And this is almost uniformly seen um, as, uh, uh, as being negative, as being something that limits our epistemic capabilities and is in general harmful to our epistemic standing. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the literature on, on filter bubbles, but from a, an epistemological perspective, we've got epistemologists such as Miller and Record arguing that personalized search reduces the justificatory status of a user's belief. And Simpson, in fact, is so perturbed by personalized search that he suggests we need government intervention of internet search providers to, in order to make sure that they're providing um, objective information and thereby serving a public good. But all of these criticisms are really based on the effect of personalized search for the individual. Once we kind of have, once we've kind of embraced this notion of Mandevillian intelligence, then we need to kind of ask ourselves whether these effects at the individual level whether those uh, uh, extend to the collective level as well. And what I've suggested in a couple of recent papers is that that simply isn't the case, that actually personalized search, although it may very well produce biased individuals that have limited access to particular bodies of information, that that same, very same process is in fact uh, encouraging a degree of uh, cognitive specialization and diversity that is then of collective benefit. So it's a benefit for the community, but not for the individual. I'm nearly done. Um, so just finishing off, one thing I want to suggest is that when we think about um, the impact of this notion of Mandevillian intelligence, we can start to think about the way in which we might be able to make productive use of individual uh, vices. Does that indicate my time's up? <laughs> we, might, um, we might be able to make productive use of this from an engineering perspective. So when we design technologies, we usually try and um, attenuate the impact of cognitive biases and cognitive shortcomings. We're trying to enhance the cognitive capabilities of, of the individual. But if it's the case that individual shortcomings and vices are playing a productive role at the collective level, then maybe we can use those when it comes to the development of collective intelligence systems or socio-epistemic systems. So we have this kind of notion of individual cognitive vice as being part of a kind of part of the mechanisms that technology developers can rely on. And one of the, I mean, you may think that, that this is um, uh, this is just mere speculation, but actually in the context of research programs that, that I'm involved in, we are developing technologies that actually do this. So they actually capitalize on the fact that individuals are susceptible to anchoring biases and confirmation bias. And we do that, uh, the kind of task that we're working with is an intelligence analysis task. We do that in order to ensure that individual intelligence analysts have very different viewpoints of, a, uh, of an analytic problem or analytic domain 
in order to ensure, one, that we've got sufficient coverage of all the possible interpretations, and two, that we've got um, enough diversity to promote a good argument when we bring everyone together and, and, they, and they all discuss the issue. That's important for avoiding another kind of cognitive bias which exists at the collective level, a kind of hidden knowledge effect or what's called a common knowledge effect. So the idea here essentially is that you're using individual vice to combat the kind of potential flaws that might have emerged in a collective context. So in summary, um, I said that in general, I think many of the, the features of emerging digital technologies support the potential emergence of extended cognitive systems. But I think there's a potential tension between um, uh, the way in which those properties support extended uh, uh, minds and the extent to which they support extended knowers. It doesn't follow that extended knowers uh, naturally uh, emerge just because you've managed to engineer an extended mind. And um, I suggested one way in which we might begin to think about avoiding that is to contemplate the way in which the web is emerging as a form of critical infrastructure for society, that we've kind of got this degree of interpenetration between social processes and technological processes um, that all kind of center on the web. Um, I didn't cover distributed credit for reasons of time, but um, this is uh, on the paper. This is contained in the paper on, on the Google Drive. And then I finished by talking about Mandevillian intelligence and the notion of virtue relativism and suggested that when we think about the, um, the, vi the virtuous or vicious nature of technologies, we need to be mindful of the extent to which we're thinking of systems at either the individual level, the level of individual epistemic agents, or at a more collective level, at the level of socio-epistemic systems or epistemic group agents. And then finally, in terms of the potential impact of um, these kinds of ideas, I think we need to take seriously the possibility that we might be able to exploit uh, individual vice for the purposes of producing uh, virtuous socio-epistemic systems. <laughs>